Today, we are traveling 800 feet below the surface into the famous Carlsbad Caverns to learn why it is so unique. I was totally alone in this cave and not gonna lie, it made me a little nervous. My anxiety is through the roof, <laughs> but I'm trying to stay calm. I love caves, but caves also terrify me, but I'm fine. Hi all, I'm Geology Joes and I go into caves so you don't have to. If you want to learn how caves form along with the delicate formations found in them, stick around because that's what we'll be getting into today. Before we descend into the cave, we must first talk about what happened at the surface to cause this natural wonder. And to find this answer, I visited a national park I've never heard of. Just 40 minutes southwest of Carlsbad Cavern sits a lesser visited and lesser known national park called Guadalupe Mountains National Park. The Guadalupe Mountains are part of the geological area known as the Permian Basin, which makes up the same rock layers found in Carlsbad Caverns. In other words, without the Guadalupe Mountains, we would not have Carlsbad Caverns so I can't talk about one and not the other. The time period these rocks were deposited is known as the Permian, which occurred between 299 million years ago to 252 million years ago when the supercontinent Pangaea existed. This was a time period marked by vast explosion of complex animal life, which included diverse reptile species and the precursors to mammals. During the Permian, this area was located along the western edge of Pangaea and was covered by a shallow inland sea known as the Delaware Sea. In this shallow sea, you would find an extensive barrier reef known today as Capitan Reef, which would have consisted primarily of algae and sponges rather than animals like corals. Inhabitants of the rocky sea bottom included sea urchins, bivalve clams, and flower-like crinoids. Horn corals and trilobites were present, but rare. Carnivorous ammonoids and nautiloids, a relative of the squid, propelled through open waters in search of prey. Deeper on the reef, large clam-like brachiopods and bryozoans clustered in colonies. Reefs are typically divided into three main parts the fore reef, the reef crest, and the back reef. The back reef being the portion closest to the shore and the fore reef being exposed to the open ocean. The reef crest is an algal ridge that acts as a cement-like barrier between the two zones and faces the initial impact of incoming ocean waves. During the Permian period, waves would have battered the Capitan Reef, causing chunks of the reef to fall off. These pieces accumulated at the front of the reef, forming the fore reef. The fore reef consists of a shallow, intermediate, and deep zone, which then meets a vertical cliff face that descends into the depths of the ocean basin. Each of these zones are marked by varying organism diversity. The intermediate zone would have been the favored among corals, brachiopods, bryozoans, and echinoderms in the Permian because of low wave energy and relatively high sunlight exposure. The back reef area is included in a larger zone known as the reef flat. This reef flat area contains features like lagoons and salty mudflats. For the most part, this area is protected by ocean waves, meaning that the water is typically stagnant and muddy. When the tide regresses, parts of this area are exposed. Over time, the Capitan Reef went through a process called lithification, where the sediment and skeletal remains became rock. But this took several million years. 260 million years ago, the connection between the Delaware Sea and the rest of the ocean was closed, expediting the rate of evaporation. As the inland sea evaporated, salt and other evaporite minerals were left behind, gradually covering the reef. Over time, mud and other sediments filled this drying basin and engulfed the reef, preserving its remnants in today's Guadalupe Mountains. 
The reef remained hidden under millions of years of overlying rock and sediment until about 80 million years ago when tectonic processes began to slowly uplift the entire region. Faulting approximately 25 million years ago uplifted a large section of the reef, allowing erosion to remove soft sediments and expose what is now known as one of the best preserved Permian fossil reefs in the world. Across the region, you can find different types of rocks and reef fragments, which represent different sections of this ancient reef. The shallow back reef is now a thick section of sandstone and dolomite, a carbonate rock that forms in the presence of high magnesium concentrations. Most life forms could not survive in the high saline waters of the back reef, but fossils from those exposures tell us that some adapted well. These include fossils of blue-green algae, masses of small cigar-shaped fusilinids, and clam-like ostracods. The reef crest is marked by a thick, fossil-encrusted section of limestone. And the lithified fore reef is a less cemented lime mud that contains fossil fragments. This is awesome to see. You see all these, like, funky shapes? Well, the way that forms is you have a soft layer getting deposited, but it's not fully lithified when the next layer gets deposited on top of it. So the layer on top weighs down the softer, non-lithified sediment below. And then when the rock lithifies, it makes all of these fun little bends in the rock. The more you know. Fossils found here include trilobites, brachiopods, sea urchins, algae, and bryozoans. The deepest parts of this ancient shallow sea are marked by thin, carbon-rich black limestones separated by thicker beds of fine-grained sandstone and the occasional siltstone. This limestone contains abundant dead plant and animal material that washed down from the reef. In the stagnant depths of the ocean basin, burial and decomposition of the dead organisms created an anoxic environment, causing them to be preserved, and eventually, with heat and pressure, transform the organic material into present-day oil and gas deposits. Sections of Capitan Reef are similar to those found in the Florida Keys today, but the climate during the Permian would have been much warmer, more like the modern-day climate of the Persian Gulf. The many canyons that carve through the Guadalupe Mountains, as well as the low abundance of vegetation and soil over the formation, provide exceptional cross-sectional views of the Capitan Reef. This formation is over 1,800 feet thick, two to three miles wide, and over 400 miles long, not only encompassing Carlsbad Caverns, but considerable portions of New Mexico and Texas. If you are in the area, I highly recommend doing some fossil hunting, but keep in mind that it is illegal to take anything from the National Park. Well, I'm not going any farther because something must have died up here. There's so many flies. So, nope. Immediate no. After exploring Guadalupe Mountains National Park, I made my way underground. As I mentioned, I was the only one in this cave for a large portion of my hike. Even though it's a well-traveled and developed cave, I couldn't help feeling a little spooked, especially since I neglected to turn on my headlamp. Not because I wanted an authentic experience, but because I forgot it was on my head. You probably can't see me at all, but I feel really disoriented right now with how dark it is. I do not see well in the dark. So I feel a little dizzy. Or maybe that's because I didn't eat breakfast. Most of the world's limestone caves, approximately 90%, are created when surface water flows down through the cracks in the limestone. 
surface water carries a weak acid known as carbonic acid that dissolves the surrounding limestone, turning cracks into passageways. These types of caves are typically very wet and have bodies of water in them. However, there are no flowing water bodies in any of the hundreds of caves in the Guadalupe Mountains and no evidence they were dissolved by carbonic acid. So if not carved by carbonic acid, then by what? Lizard people? Since the 1970s, geologists have found the answer to what makes Carlsbad Caverns so unique. Evidence shows that when hydrogen sulfide from oil deposits in that carbon-rich black limestone combine with microbes and oxygen in the underground water table, sulfuric acid is produced. This is a very aggressive acid, which dissolves passageways along cracks, fractures, and faults at the level of the water table. The water table is the boundary between water-saturated ground and unsaturated ground. During the uplift of the Guadalupe Mountains around 80 million years ago, the level of the water table dropped in relation to the land surface, taking the sulfuric acid with it. When the water table dropped, it left a newly dissolved cave behind. This uplift continued to happen over millions of years, causing the water table to drop and the cave passages to get deeper. Radioactive dating has shown that Carlsbad Cavern was one of the last caves to be dissolved in the Guadalupe Mountains around 4 to 6 million years ago. This method of sulfuric acid dissolution created maze of both narrow and huge Swiss cheese-like passageways. A byproduct of this process is a mineral called gypsum, which is visible as huge blocks on the floor of Big Room in Carlsbad Cavern. Because these caves were dissolved deep underground, and not from the surface, not all caves here have an opening to the world above. But luckily for us, sometime in the past few million years, the natural entrance of Carlsbad Caverns was created by surface erosion. This exposed previously hidden underground cave passageways to the elements, resulting in some of the spectacular speleothems people travel from all over to see. Speleothems encompass the decorative cave formations seen all throughout Carlsbad Caverns, like stalactites, stalagmites, and more. They are due to rain and snowmelt soaking through the limestone, which eventually drips into the cave. These water droplets absorb gases and dissolve minerals from the soil and limestone above, and eventually release carbon dioxide and deposit a small amount of calcite in the air-filled cave. Drip by drip, Carlsbad Caverns has been slowly adding decor. The slowest drips tend to stay on the ceiling long enough to deposit minerals there. Here you will find stalactites, soda straws, diapirs, ribbons, and curtains. The faster the water drips, the more likely it is to make it to the cave floor. Here you will find totem poles, flowstone, rimstone dams, lily pads, shelves, cave pools, and of course, stalagmites. Today, few speleothems are still actively growing thanks to the dry desert climate of New Mexico. Most speleothems inside Carlsbad Caverns would have been more active 10,000 years ago during the last ice age. As the National Park Service says, the dripping heard today inside the cavern is but a fading echo of what would have been heard during the wetter times long ago. <laughs> so weird. I thought I was going to have to walk all the way back up all of the stairs, but no. You walk down and then there's an elevator that takes you 725 feet back up to the surface. <laughs> Yay! I hope you enjoyed learning about this cave as much as I enjoyed exploring it. If you have any geology questions, leave them down in the comment section below, and I will try to answer them. For more geology adventures, make sure you subscribe to the channel and share my page with other geology lovers. I'll catch you next time!